How do we quickly analyze a property? We'll get into that in today's video. But before we start, if you do me a favor, hit the thumbs up button. If you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe. And let's get into the video. There are two rules that I use to quickly analyze a list of properties. This helps me easily eliminate properties so that I cannot waste time and get right into the good properties. And there's also two numbers I like to calculate for each property. We'll get into those as well. They help analyze the property, see if it's worth the deal. These two rules aren't the only rules you should use to analyze a property, but they should help you screen through properties quickly so you can get to the good ones. Before we start and get into the rules, I need you to understand that when you get into real estate investing, you have to be able to understand numbers and be comfortable with simple math and the equations. The first time you might hear something, it might not make sense to you, and that's okay. Rewind, rewatch the video, get a couple books that'll help you explain it and understand it better. Remember, real estate investing is all about the numbers. The 1% rule. Simply put, whatever you purchase the property for, you should at least be able to get 1% of the purchase price for rent. So for example, if you purchase a property for $150,000, you should be able to rent it for $1,500 a month. Some markets can get up to 2%, so you have to know your market when you're analyzing a deal. The 50% rule means that all your expenses for the property, not including financing, should be 50% or less of your monthly rent. So from the example earlier, a $1,500 a month rent, we should only be paying at most $750 a month towards our expenses. So anything left over would be your cash flow. If you're financing the deal, you subtract your mortgage from that number and you would have your cash flow. If the property meets these two criteria, the 1% rule and the 50% rule, there's two more things that I do to analyze the deal to make sure it'll work for me. I first calculate the cap rate, which is short for capitalization rate. It's the net operating income, or NOI, divided by the purchase price. This is comparable to an interest rate on a savings account. So today, if you go up in a savings account, you're probably getting less than 1%, closer to zero on interest if you're getting any interest at all. So all of our deals better be a lot higher than that. NOI is all the generated income from the property, also known as gross income, and you subtract the expenses, not including finances, from that number. So in our earlier example, the $150,000 property with $1,500 a month rent would gross us $18,000 a year in rent. We would then need to figure out our expenses. For this example, we're going to assume it passed the 50% rule and that our expenses were $575 monthly or $6,900 annually. So to calculate our NOI, we would take our $18,000 gross income, subtract the $6,900, and get $11,100 a year annual income, NOI, net operating income. So to calculate the cap rate, we would take the $11,100, divide that by $150,000 purchase price, and get 7.4% cap rate. So what's a good cap rate? Depending on who you talk to, you'll get different answers. Everyone has their own goals and requirements. For me personally, I try to get over 12% cap rate. I'm okay with 10%, and depending on the property, I might go as low as 8%. Depending on the property's location and condition, a lower cap rate may not necessarily be a bad thing. The other number I use when I analyze a property is cash on cash return, or money in versus money out which is the annual net cash flow divided by the total cash invested into the property. Total cash invested would be down payments, closing costs, repairs, inspections, anything that you would have paid money for to purchase the house. Cash flow is similar to the NOI that we calculated earlier. However, this time we account for our mortgage payment monthly. The difference here between cash on cash return and cap rate is we account for the mortgage payment in our expenses. Let's take two examples of the same house, one with a loan and one paying cash. We use the same house from earlier, $150,000 purchase price, $18,000 gross income, and $6,900 annual expenses. So to purchase this house cash, we're going to assume a $3,500 closing cost. You would need $153,500 to close on the house. We know that there's $6,900 in expenses and $18,000 in gross rent. So $18,000 minus $6,900 is $11,100 annual cash flow. If we take that $11,100, and divide it by $153,500, we will get 0.072 or 7.2% cash on cash return. 
If we use the same property, but this time we get a loan, let's see how the numbers look. Let's go with a 20% down payment, so $30,000, $4,500 in closing costs, so a total of $34,500 to close on the house. A 30-year mortgage at 4.5% would be about $608 a month, or $7,296 annually. If we take our $11,100 and subtract our $7,296 for mortgage, we're left over with $3,804 of annual cash flow. If we take the $3,804 and divide that by $34,500, that gives us 0.11 or an 11% cash on cash return. The numbers show us that getting a mortgage on this house would be a better return on investment. And if you had the cash to purchase this house, why not buy three houses, leveraged, and now you own three properties versus one at a better return on investment? What's a good cash on cash return? Similar to cap rate, it'll depend on the situation. Personally, I like to strive for 12% and higher, but depending on the location or the condition of the house, I will go a little bit lower. We just went over a lot of numbers. And you have to remember, garbage in, garbage out. So if the numbers given to you by the realtor or the seller aren't accurate, your analysis isn't good. When I first analyze a deal, I'll use the numbers given to me by the realtor or the seller. If my quick analysis says that it might be a good deal, then I'll dive deeper into the numbers. Some things to think about when you're looking at the numbers. Are the rents too high? Are the rents too low? Are the expenses accurate? Are they high or low? One of the expenses I always double check is the insurance. The seller might be giving you what he's paying for the insurance, but what are the chances you're going to pay the same thing? So I always call my insurance agent and I go to quote for the house that I'm considering. If all the numbers work out and you walk the property, you might want to take a contractor or an inspector with you. They can point out some deferred maintenance or possible repairs that are needed that you can use in your analysis of the deal. When I'm plugging in my numbers for the deal, I like to round up for my expenses because I would rather have my expenses be a little bit high versus too low. I hope this video helped you understand how to analyze a deal a little bit better. If this is your first time seeing some of these formulas and numbers, I highly recommend re-watching the video and taking some notes. Look forward to seeing you in the next video. Thank you.